international operations and cultural differences. For my job, I traveled more across the United States and Europe and Asia. Throughout, I observed vast diversity in people and cultures. Attitudes often reflected daily life challenges. Philanthropy and generosity and kindness and helpfulness were tied to resources beyond those needed for just personal and family and friend survival. Struggling to survive or care for your loved ones had to all be fulfilled before someone could focus on others. Indeed, struggling to survive or care for your loved ones all but eliminates your ability to have compassion and the capacity to give to others. People allege that hardship breeds greater unity and collaboration, but I have seen it breeds cutthroat, dog-eat-dog, -dog, survive-at-all-cost behavior. Scraping by to survive leads to cornered animal irrational desperation that will bite the hand that would otherwise feed and care for it. Long-standing victim or conqueror complexes can lead to inappropriate delusions of grandeur and capability or can result in low confidence and a constant need for encouragement and cheerleading and hand-holding through problems and their solutions. Throughout the world, I have seen entire cultures and companies that evolved to be any one or combination of those attitudes. One, philanthropic and generous. Two, struggling and desperate. Or three, victim or conqueror. Combinations thereof. Attitudes in companies that I worked with globally seem to vary so greatly based on local culture and how dense their homes were and according to government and political influences and control. I suppose the biggest driver to cultural and operational dissimilarities was how affluent a group was and thusly how removed from fear of survival they were. After survival needs had been satisfied, affluence was able to corrupt when so much wealth flowed that it disrupted the need for innovation. Geographic location, including weather and greenery versus cityscapes, greatly affected people's outlook in life, right up to their hope and aspirations. It could reduce them to functional workers and checklist scheduling and management. Environment made a difference. Government rules and laws and taxes and operations could be motivating or soul-crushing to people and had dramatic effects on their productivity and their ability to be creative and innovative and politics. The governance they were, they engendered fear of the future and uncertainty of what may come. Politics were powerful. They could erode productivity and exclude a game that otherwise could have been successful if it dared touch a political topic that was taboo. One thing was clear. Stay clear of politics and local government rules and laws and taxes. Although I emphasized with everyone that worked with me when dealing with external contracted companies that our job was to define the work that needed to be done and establish confidence that it can be done to the quality and on time within the budget and resources available to us for that project. But it was also very important to empower those external companies and their staff to do the work and manage their staff themselves. It was a common mistake to micromanage and direct outside companies and their teams as if they were internal groups. Micromanaging external companies often eroded trust and a sense of partnership. It also eroded product innovation and quality. In my experience, 
when the same people supervise creation, the same things are created. Therefore, empower different people to lead creation, to avoid shackling innovation with control. There are times that different cultures are too much to tolerate. Yeah, some people in some companies are just incompatible with you and your organization. That is no big deal. It is entirely reasonable to have people and groups that you get along with and those that you do not get along with. I used to draw on a whiteboard a big V and I'd write inside that V the word culture and say this is what we are. This is our culture inside the V. Then I would draw a larger, bigger V around the first V, our culture V. They would share the bottom point, the bottom vertex, and I would write across the outer edges between the outer and the inner V, the word fringe. And I'd say that's the fringe culture. We can tolerate the fringe. They're still adjacent to our core culture. They're fringe culture. They're okay. And then I would draw a giant semicircle filling the rest of the area to the V. And I'd say all of this and behind is counterculture. We don't tolerate counterculture. We oppose it. It is against us. And so I would conclude. We should prefer companies and people that share our core culture. We can still sign and tolerate fringe culture companies, but we should reject counter culture companies because they will undermine our values and goals. In the end, I counseled people, internal and external, to our company alike to be flexible and to adapt to each group's unique perspective and their laws and governance and cultures and their traditions but steadfastly do not compromise our values or our culture or our traditions. There must be room for both our and their cultural needs and values and practices while we work together professionally. I always found that it was especially important to be compassionate and understanding of people living and working in foreign countries or regions that have vastly different cultural values and traditions and behaviors. But what I have found the most intriguing is the why of it. Why and how do cultures and their values and traditions and signage and artifacts evolve into reality? I have found there are a few reasons. One, government legal and operating influences. Some cultural differences were the result of government influence, not the result of people's ideologies or beliefs. In fact, I observed through my travels that individual philosophies bore little impact on the culture they lived within. The most notable government actions that I have seen are censorship and information suppression and even disinformation and propaganda. Mobocracy corrupt government run by mobsters. The turning on and off of utilities like natural gas to force people in and out of their home and bed and up to and from work at given times on schedule, according to the government's schedule. Or the vanishing or canceling of people that oppose the government or its objectives. And incentives to do what the government wants cash, freedoms, childcare, pizza, whatever, some kind of special incentive, a perk. And things that challenge your survival. There truly is no greater driver of values and beliefs than survival. And there are so many things that threaten our survival and well-being. Hunger and famine, insufficient water, lack of shelter and power, heating and cooling, ex 
extreme weather, cold and heat, threat from people and animals, disease and maladies, familial harm and ruin, media and government disinformation and propaganda, conflict and outright war, extraordinary, charismatic and influential people, and so many more external influences that change culture. Until a person is no longer focused on survival, they cannot afford the time or money or resources to invest in anything else but enduring and getting to their tomorrow. As an aside, philanthropy stems from a fruitful and successful life where the individual or people have exceeded survival and have accumulated an abundance that they may invest back in culture and civilization and give to other people. And then there's nuke and pave. In life, there are occasions that are so devastating, physically or emotionally so painful, that they shatter our very core beliefs and in tearing our values asunder. There is an open wound for new ideas and views to infiltrate and integrate themselves into that person's psyche. Indeed, when a traumatic event happens to a person, they become highly susceptible to outside influences and ideological change. Examples of nuke and pave moments are kidnapping, rape, murder, family disintegration and devastation, extreme accidents, life-altering medical conditions, so much. And finally, of course, culture can be greatly influenced just by an infinite number of influences and triggers. In the end, I do imagine there are countless, if not infinite, influences and triggers that shape cultures and their values and traditions. I have seen the above cultural influences to be the strongest, but I am certain and sure there are many others that many people will think of that I have not listed. I believe it is nearly impossible to craft or foster a culture or outlook on life that exists in isolation of the reality around us. Through my business travels, I met a tall, thin woman with Russian features and long blonde hair. She dressed professionally, but with a sexy selection of clothing, a blouse, skirt, nylons, heels, and she always wore makeup and had her nails well done. Her name was Olya Nikitova. Olya was not just an intense woman in person, she had an intense life history. Olya grew up in a small town in Russia. Her natural beauty was uncommon in her hometown, and she was not satisfied with whiling her life away marrying a local and just having kids and growing old and eventually dying, just like her ancestors all did. She was not going to wait for something good to come to her. Olya was determined to make her life into something. Although I do not know the details of how Olya Nikitova found her path in life, but she had found her way to Moscow and she was discovered by a Russian secret service KGB. The Russian KGB wanted to leverage Olya's beauty as a spy for espionage. She was married to a fellow KGB agent, and they started an international business to provide for hire contract services for computer graphics and tools and applications and computer and video games. The idea was to have a legitimate reason to travel all over the globe. Nikotova's offices were in London, UK, Chicago, USA, Moscow, Russia, and Kiev, Ukraine. Olya called her company Nikotova after her surname. 
Olya was very proud of herself and how she had escaped her small town trap. Olya Nikitova was highly intelligent and shrewd and attractive by even the most discriminating attitudinal people. Olya's intensity and unwavering, relentless drive to succeed and overcome any obstacle or barrier came across a little bit as a bad attitude to most people. A first impression would make someone worry that she might be so intense or too aggressive in her motivation to triumph and succeed. They might worry that her own attitude would get in her way of success. But I can say Olya had her attitude that kept her going despite the adversity and danger throughout her life. For reference, in my game Escape from Hell, I put a rock band in it called The Tunes because I have always felt having a bad attitude can cause so much consternation and trouble for people that it should be a low-grade, damnable offense. Olya's attitude could have been a problem for me working with her, but we shared a lot of common beliefs, and so we never had any interpersonal disagreements or issues at all. In fact, as I worked with Olya Nikitova, I grew to respect her and had a very good relationship with her. In hindsight, it seems that I also had an attitude, since Olya and I appeared to be cut from the same get-it-done cloth. It was as if she shared some of my DNA blueprint for how to succeed, like the science fiction movie Terminator. It was customary to have work dinners with contract partner leaders and key staff and sometimes even with line workers as a reward or a retention event. During such a work dinner with Olya Nikitova in Kiev, Ukraine, we all had been drinking, perhaps a bit too much wine, and Olya shared that she was previously a Russian KGB agent and that she was funded by KGB operations to create Nikitova offices around the world so that Russia would have inroads without suspicion or question. Olya was apparently a key KGB global operative. She explained her husband was and still operated as a KGB agent, but that she was virtually never seeing him. It was a marriage for appearances and further travel flexibility for both he and her. It all sounded exciting and rather unbelievable. Well, Olya suggested that working for the KGB was more fantasy than dangerous. Mostly, she just transported documents and materials on encrypted electronic devices or passed messages on in person. Or she moved some cash to pay off a contractor for doing some work for Olya or her husband or the KGB. She remains apparently associated with the KGB. She explained at the dinner, you do not quit from the KGB. You just go silent and wait. But Olya Nikitova had become a dedicated full-time businesswoman and no longer engaged with KGB operations, she explained. Or at least that's what she said. She was just on call. And Olya fit right in with her new primary headquarters based in Kiev, Ukraine, a country ruled by mobsters. The Ukraine was a mobocracy. Most companies were hyper-concerned with what I thought of their staff and organization and facilities, and of course, their ability to create compelling games and art, sound, and music. Why were they so worried? Well because I could shut down their business with my organization and most likely most other groups and companies that I knew. I would certainly be able to cancel their contracts immediately. My great and powerful reputation as chief technology officer, my reputation as chief technology officer and long history of delivering many successful games 
added to groups fears of my potential harm to their reputation should I go on a mission to expose their group for bad behavior or failure to honor or deliver on commitments. Nikitova was no different than most companies. It wanted to be successful and generate a lot of money and ideally give its staff a good experience as the business plowed forward. Its reputation was critical to its maintaining and securing new work. And so Nikitova, like most companies, worried what I thought of their team and capabilities and their facilities. During one of my visits to the company, Nikitova in Kiev, Ukraine, I observed a frumpy man in a trench coat arrive and wait for Olya Nikitova to arrive herself to discuss pressing business matters, according to the office manager, who also doubled as a receptionist and all around get stuff done gopher for the office. She told me that the man visits every few months to speak with Olya and emphasized it was business as usual. The admin escorted me to the team where I spent the next few hours. After my time with Nikitova's team, I returned to the admin, whereupon I saw the frumpy man was still waiting. He looked perturbed, if not outright angry. My timing was fortunate for me, and perhaps unfortunate for Nikitova. Its founder, Olya Nikitova, rushed in from the front door and handed the man an envelope as she spoke in what sounded like Russian, though I am not sure if it was Russian or Ukrainian, of course. The frumpy man rose and returned terse, presumably Russian words, and handed a manila envelope to Olya. Later in the day, I asked the admin who the man was and why did Olya give him an envelope in exchange for something in a manila envelope. The admin seemed cornered by my question. She shyly answered that the man was a government safety and codes compliance inspector and that he was there to confirm their facility was maintained and safe for staff to work in. Now, I can tell you that the man never inspected a single thing. He just arrived and sat in a little visitor meeting waiting room. And then he was given something in a letter-sized envelope and he returned a large full sheet manila envelope in exchange. It was suspicious to say the least. The admin saw my disbelief, an evident incredulous view of her suggesting that he was a safety inspector when he did nothing at all related to inspecting. Well, maybe he inspected the contents of the envelope after he left since he did not do it when he was there in the office. Finally, the admin cracked under the awkward, silent stare of disbelief. She said the inspector was paid cash to complete the inspection, and that is how they are allowed to maintain their business license in Kiev. She asserted that if he decides not to do an inspection on any given visit, that was his prerogative. After all, he was the inspector. It was clear to me. The inspector was corrupt and on the take for bribes and deals to look the other way. The physical building of Nikitova was both awe-inspiring and a little bit scary. Upon arriving, you saw a cyclone fence with razor wire and suspended on car wheels chained to a motor so it could quickly open and close a massive gate. On either side of the double-wide razor fence driveway stood guard towers with armed guards with assault rifles and allegedly sidearms as well. There was a buzzer in the front, but the guards barked down from their 15-foot perches well before you could get near a buzzer. They only wanted to hear that you were there to visit the company Nikitova. If you were there for anything or anyone else, you were to leave immediately or else. Olya Nikitova informed me that the guards came with the building lease. The Ukraine expected that people keep their jobs if it was feasible, and apparently Nikitova needed the security 
for the building and so agreed that they would employ the previous owner's guards as part of the lease terms. So why was Nikitova in a building that had armed guards? As it turned out, Olya wanted an extremely safe and secure building, one that could survive an assault. Because her business was in Kiev, which was a mobocracy, she knew that there could be genuine physical threats to her or the company, and so she wanted to be secure. Olya found a deal on a facility that had extraordinary security. It was a weapons and munitions factory. Indeed, Olya leased a building that was previously used to manufacture munitions and weapons for the government. And so, the hyper-secured facility made sense. Crazy, wild, but it made sense. Russia and the Ukraine were renowned for their hacker talent pool and the stereotype reputation of a willingness to copy and leverage code, tech, apps, tools, designs, anything. Of course, there are many people that would argue the stereotype is not justified. However, it was not relevant if it was true or not because Electronic Arts worldwide executives believed that it was true. And so consequently, I had to operate as if it were true. Adopt the trust but verify mantra going forward, working with Russia and the Ukraine. In order to sign a contract with Nikitova, we coordinated with them to one, build a vault room with 24-7, 365 days a year video surveillance that is recorded off-site and available to us through a cloud all the time. Two, house all computers and devices that are capable of storing data inside the vault. And their mice and keyboards and monitors would be cabled through walls to the machines inside the vault. Three, they would destroy all USB ports on all devices, even those inside the vault, to reduce odds that anyone could copy or clone anything on a thumb drive, portable disk drive, whatever. It would reduce the odds of intentional virus infection as well. Four, isolate all network devices within the subnet and block all external internet access from every machine within the vault. And five, define formal policies and training for exiting and entering the vault and how to interface with those machines for existing and new hires. And finally, how it would all be enforced. It felt weird and it did not seem like it was much of a good show of faith to put so many controls and measures in place against, to monitor, to control Nikitova. But it had to be done to satisfy EA Worldwide and EA Canada's paranoid executives. The people at Nikitova were hardworking and dedicated to their craft. They loved technology, games, art and animation, and sound and music. They loved all things tech and entertainment but they also had a hard life in the Ukraine. There were health issues and birth defects resulting from the nuclear reactor Chernobyl's meltdown, not far from Kiev where Nikitova operated. The government turned off natural gas and thus home heating, cooking, showering. They were all timed for political motivations to control when people got up, ate, went to work, showered, went to sleep. Gender inequality was widespread men defaulted to extreme chauvinism. Owning a home was reserved for only the super wealthy. Ordinary people lived in oppressive apartment complexes or in crowded houses. Good jobs were scarce. People endured a lot of negativity and abuse at work because they needed the income just to survive. Even engineers and university-educated people struggled to advance beyond basic existence. It became evident to me that Nikitova's staff had a great work ethic and they were excited to learn and deliver compelling products and assets. 
I have seen throughout my life at different times, in different companies, and in different countries, people working all night to deliver something great that they believe wholeheartedly in. Nikotova's staff were all in. The team at Nikotova slept so often at their company that they kept futons in the office that they could unfold and sleep beside or under their desk tables. I had seen it in Canada. I had seen it in England. I had seen it in the United States. Seeing it in the Ukraine did not seem unusual to me for passionate video game developers. It underscored they were passionate about the work they did. They were committed to great work. Nikotova's staff were determined to succeed at all costs, no matter how long or how much effort was required. I observed that hard lives often make people work harder and have higher integrity. Life's difficulty levels seem directly proportionate to how much integrity and work ethic they had.